previously on the keys of time. God has sovereignly set in order the ages of time to accomplish his plan of redemption. He has established a time frame to bring his purposes to pass. He's not making it up as he goes along. He has a simple but wonderful structure of time. And we're going to discover his timetable and how he is sovereignly working out his purposes exactly on time. We'll also understand the special time that we live in now and how this fits into the overall plan, confirming actually that we are living in the end times. He gives us a major clue about the blueprint that he uses for this. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Many Jewish rabbis and church fathers have seen this as God giving in code the key to unlock his overall structure of time. One day with the Lord is a thousand years with man. Next, we need, need to discover the fundamental blueprint that God has ordained for the overall structure of time. Then we can use the key. We don't have to look very hard for this divine blueprint. God revealed his fundamental pattern of time in the creation week, which is the blueprint for all weeks. The Bible begins with the seven days of creation. One day is a thousand years, so one week of seven days is 7,000 years. You see, the seven days of creation week are a picture of the seven days or 7,000 years of man's history. On the left, we see creation week. There are six days, followed by the sanctified seventh day. Applying our key, we see on the right-hand side the corresponding week of history, 6,000 years, followed by a special 1,000 years, or the millennium. Now, if this is correct, we should expect the Bible to confirm this pattern of time. Does it speak about a 1,000 years of rest at the end of time? The answer, of course, is a resounding yes. You see, the Old Testament prophets foresaw this golden age when the Messiah would come and rule over the earth and establish a kingdom of peace, when even the earth would be freed from the curse and be at rest. So we have two days from Adam to Abraham's birth. Genesis 1 to 11 deals with the first 2,000 years. There is no Israel yet, so I'm going to call this the age of the Gentiles. We then have two days from Abraham's birth to the cross of Christ. This is the age of Israel. Genesis 12 onwards and the rest of the Old Testament and the Gospel deals with these 2,000 years. Then we have two days between Christ's first and second comings. This is the church age. Then we have the final, the seventh day of man's history, the millennium, the day or age of the Lord. What a marvelous pattern. Can you see the whole Bible falling into place? So much makes sense once we understand this fundamental structure of time. Today we're going to study and discover more keys that unlock God's plan of the ages. Previously, we've seen that God's overall structure of time, as God planned it and sees it, is based on the creation week. With seven days of a thousand years, each corresponding to the seven days of 24 hours. Just as the seventh day is a day of rest after six days of labor, so the seventh day of history will be a thousand years of rest under Christ's blessing after six thousand years of struggle under the curse. In the first six days, he's working to establish his messianic kingdom on earth. In the seventh day, he will enter into rest, having accomplished this. Next, we take a closer look at God's design of each day to see how it is structured, as this should give us further insight into the days of human history. Each day is divided into two periods, day, the period of light, and night, the period of darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, one day, Genesis 1.5. God told Israel to reckon the start of a day at evening, not midnight as we now do, Evening, or sunset, is the close of the day and the start of the night. Morning, or sunrise, is the start of the day and the close of the night. 
Since God divides each day of 24 hours into two equal parts, we might expect that God would likewise divide each day of a thousand years into two halves of 500 years. In particular, we expect the history of Israel to be marked out by God as a continuous series of 500-year cycles. This chart shows the pattern that we would get if this were applied to the great week of history. When we look at the history of Israel, however, we find that it is marked by cycles of 490 years rather than 500 years, such as Daniel's cycle of 490 years, the 70 weeks or sevens of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. We will now see how the key of the Jubilee Principle solves this discrepancy in a wonderful way. We will see that the actual history of Israel provides amazing confirmation of this whole pattern of time. To comprehend this, we must first understand the next two keys of time. Ignorance of these lesser known keys is a major reason why Bible chronology is generally not understood well today. To understand Bible chronology, we must comprehend the divine framework or template by which God sovereignly controls the course of time. This is called the redemption chronology, for it measures the progress of his plan of redemption. When we understand how God reckons time on his redemption chronology, we can put all the pieces together to demonstrate the Bible's perfect chronology. The next keys will explain the vital revelations required to understand how God's redemption chronology relates to time as man measures it. First, we need to explain the important distinction between a calendar and a chronology. A calendar, say for your life, will give all the events of your life on their dates. There is essentially just one calendar, even if it's presented in different ways. A chronology, however, is any way of counting or reckoning time. There are many chronologies or ways of counting time, depending on the principle you use in how you're counting time or what you're measuring. Take as an example a work-life chronology. I work a 40-hour week, you might say, or I've worked 200 hours on this. What does this mean? A solid 40 or 200 hours? Unlikely. The times when you sleep or do not work are not counted. This is a chronology a valid way of reckoning time according to a selective principle. In the case of the redemption chronology, the selective principle governing the counting of time is the progress of God's plan of redemption. It's by this chronology that God controls the whole course of time. Let us say you contracted and were paid for doing 50 days of work. These days may be spread out over 70 days if you don't work weekends, and perhaps more if you take some days off during the week. This corresponds to the concept of unreckoned time that we will discuss later on. Now, imagine you have completed 49 days with just one day left to fulfill the contract when you're told that you have now completed the 50 days. Why? Well, one of those days was a bank holiday, a day of grace where you did no work, but it was counted to you as if you worked and got paid anyway. Then, Although you worked for 49 days, it is counted as 50 days on your work chronology. There is an additional day of grace added into your work chronology as far as your pay is concerned. This is a good analogy to the Jubilee principle, which is essential to understand the chronology of redemption and which we're now going to see. So there are many ways of counting time. The main issue for us is how God counts time as far as his overall plan is concerned. We know he's measured out 7,000 years until time ends, but how does he count that? The next keys reveal that God does it according to a master chronology that's all about grace and redemption. Thus, God's government of time uses a redemption chronology based on a creation blueprint. In so doing, he reveals himself through the very structure of history as the sovereign creator and gracious redeemer. True Bible chronology reveals the glory of God.
The Jubilee Principle was discovered by Sir Edward Denny, an Irish bar baronet who lived from 1796 to 1886. He discovered the Jubilee Principle and the associated redemption chronology, the backbone of Bible chronology. Denny took his findings to the Brethren leaders, but they rejected them. He said, if men reject it, it's okay. It is God with whom I have to do. He would say, God knows what I have written is true because the heart of love has revealed it to me. As he went back to the Lord, he, the Lord told Denny, the time is not yet. In his book of 1818, he predicted the Jews were coming back to their land 130 years before it happened. Of course, he was laughed at, but God had revealed it to him through his word. It seems that the Lord has kept back the full revelation of time until the end times so that we can understand the times we live in and fulfill our purpose before the Lord returns. This agrees with Daniel 12.9 that says, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Although his work was largely forgotten, it came into the hands of a team of men under a Bible teacher called Arthur Ware, who built on the foundation built by Denny, working from 1933 through World War II and beyond. We have seen that the first fundamental revelation of the measurement of time is the Sabbath principle, that God measures time in sevens. Seven is the number that marks God's structuring of time, denoting spiritual perfection. In Hebrew, the word for seven, sheva, is derived from the word sava, to be full or satisfied, to have enough of. Hence, seven means fullness and completion. So, God rested on the seventh day because creation was full, complete, good, perfect. Nothing could be added to it or taken from it without marring it. So, the cycles of time God uses come to completion on the seventh. The Hebrew word Shabbat, which means the day of rest from exertion, is from the same root. The word for week is closely associated with the word for seven. A week equals a seven. The Sabbath equals the seventh, when the week reaches its completion. For that reason, it is a period of rest at the completion of the cycle. The Sabbath principle applies to the rhythm of our lives. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's Mark 2.27. He was meaning that a day's rest in every seven is for our good. That's how God has made us, and he has built his, this creation principle into the very structure of time. The Sabbath completes one week, renewing and preparing us for the new week. We saw the Sabbath principle also operates on God's large-scale measurement of time, of seven days of a thousand years each. The Jubilee principle is revealed in Leviticus 25, which contains the instructions for Israel's observance of time, namely, 1. The Sabbath year, Leviticus 25, 1-7. The Jubilee year, Leviticus 25, 8-13. As well as marking every seven days in remembrance of creation week, God told Israel to mark every seven years. The seventh, or Sabbath year, was to be a year of rest for the land, so that they were to rest it, rather than farm it on this seventh year. So God also measures time in 